I'd like to give a shout out to our newest sponsor, Solutions Today Supplemental Insurance. If you're a competitor in the cage, in the boxing ring, put your body on the line every time you compete, you can get cut, you can break a leg, a finger, who knows, put you out of work. It sucks. They'll provide you with 24-7, 365 days a year, supplemental insurance covering everything from hospital stays, fractures, outpatient surgery, recovery benefits, family plans, and more. They pay out in addition to all other insurance, including WSIB, employment insurance, and your work benefits. Qualification is easy. No medical tests or exam needed. No occupational restrictions and no income verification. Head on over to solutionstoday.ca and get coverage for you and your family. This podcast is brought to you by Eurosun Tanning Salon. Do you suffer from eczema or psoriasis? you have acne or sore muscles? Head on in today and visit the tanning beds. They got regular and mega stand-up beds. You get that beautifully tanned look that you're looking for. They also offer natural mystic spray tan. You can also purchase premium products such as Australian Gold, California Tan, Designer Skin, and Swedish Beauty. There's many different packages to choose from, six-session package or 30-day pass, even single sessions. Sign up today in your membership and get $70 worth of product. They're located across from Masonville Mall in the Wendy's Plaza at 60 North Centre Road, London, Ontario. Visit Eurosun Tanning today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my sponsor, Rycor Countertops. They deal in custom countertops in quartz, corian, meganite, laminate, and butcher block. They also have custom kitchen cabinetry, closets, laundry rooms, and millwork. They're family-owned and operated for 18 years, knowledgeable and highly experienced staff, and friendly customer service. Head on over to 1069 Clark Road. Check out their showroom today. Okay, welcome to Studio 88. Today, I have a very special guest, uh, Canadian icon, two-time uh, IBF ju- junior featherweight champion, Steve Molitor. Welcome to the show. My man, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I feel I'm a little starstruck right now. <laughs> you know, so forgive me for being like, like overly nervous, but uh, uh, it's not every day you see a two-time champ come into your podcast and sit across from you. Um, Fill everybody in on, on who you are in case they don't know him if, because they've been living under a fucking rock for the last <laughs> 20 years. Um, where'd it all begin for you, bro? Um, I started when I was nine years old. My brother had started boxing a year before me. The he, Bruiser Brothers, correct. The Bruise Brothers. Bruise Brothers, that's, that's what it is. I'll be honest, I would say in like one or two articles, no one ever called us that personally ever, yeah, yeah. but people blow things up when things get bad in the media and stuff like that. But like I said, he started boxing a year before me. He was Canadian champ. We were both very active. We played lots of hockey, and I just followed him my big brother's footsteps, basically, and just followed him to the gym he, um, a year after he had started, and mm-hmm. here we are today. And the rest is history. Yeah, that's amazing. So I bet you got some pretty cool stories. Oh yeah, a lot, a lot of gym wars. Somebody's actually just um, commented on my Facebook, like, "Oh, I'm out here with Silvio, your amateur coach." He said you guys used to go at it quite often. I'm like, very often. Yeah, because you know it was just me and him in the city at the time, who at the, at the top level. He was two and a half years older, 30 pounds heavier. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I mean? I was getting my ass whooped daily. And then yeah. to go home and catch one, too. From your brother? Yeah. How was that, growing up with a brother, beating the shit out of you all the time? Um, It sucked, but you know what I mean? Did that make you a better fighter, do you think? Absolutely. Like, yeah. um, without question, you know, I'm, when I go into to fight somebody, I'm like, you're my size? You're my age? Let's go. What was your brother's weight? Um, he's about 30 pounds heavier. He fought oh, so he was a, a lot bigger than Yeah, you. he fought at 147. I was mm-hmm. 112 as a Canadian, as an amateur then as a pro, they went up to 122. But yeah, he was always like 30, 40 pounds heavier. Wow. Always Stronger, getting, yeah, better. Getting, yeah, faster, beating, beating up on the little brother. Yes. Yeah, but you shine. You you pulled through, man, you, and and made a statement for yourself. <clears throat> it was tough. Like, you know what I mean? There was nights as a teenager, you know what I mean? You're getting whipped. You're driving home your bike. You got dry blood all over your face. You're crying. You think like, you know, I just I can't, I can't win. I can't overcome things. But mm-hmm. as you succeed in competition and realize that, you know, it may be bad in the gym, but you know, it's going to benefit you in the long run. And even as a professional, when I moved to Toronto, <clears throat> I always brought in the best sparring possible. You know, I've mm-hmm. been to a lot of training camps with Eric Morales and stuff, and I see why they're so great because they didn't bring in guys that can just beat on all day. They brought in top-level, up-and-coming stars 
just to make them better because training camp, you know, you want to you want to push yourself and become better. And, you know, that's what I what I did when I became professional. Because mm-hmm. your amateur career record is, 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 is like, like amazing. I had like 120 amateur fights, yeah. 121, I think they said, with like 100 wins or something like that, roughly. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Like, that's a lot of ring time. Yeah, it's a lot of ring time. And plus, like, um, you know, with all the brain injuries and stuff going on now, you hear people saying, oh, the, you know, the fighting's bad, the fighting's mm-hmm. bad. If you're sparring three days a week, you know what I mean? Going to war three days a week, four weeks a month. That's where a lot of damage happens, but, I mean, it's part of the game. Do you find uh, you have any um, <laughs> side effects from stuff like that? Um, absolutely, I do. Like, physical side effects, like, I'm always in pain and stuff like that. But I still go to the gym every single day. Mm. Because you're young. You're, you're actually younger than I am. I'm 40 almost. Yeah. I'm How old are you? I'm 40. You look good, I'm uh, Yeah, yeah. I'm 40. I'm 40. I turned 40 this year, but you're what, 39? 39. Yeah, I'll be 40 yeah. in April. But yeah, um, I wouldn't say like too, too bad, but like if me and you are, you know, say at a at a grocery store in the lineup and it's comes to who's going first, well, I'm going first. Because mm-hmm. you, get, you get that alpha male, that alpha male like to the most extreme level Really, you got to be the most dominant person in the room at all times. So that never really turned off for you then? Um, it has. Now that I have two kids and, you know, I have a stable job and I'm just kind of a little bit older now, I'm a lot more relaxed and laid back. But mm-hmm. when you're champion of the world and every, and all the cameras are on you and the lights are on you, it really amplifies that that feeling of being the elf. And you got to be the best. And you got to be the king all the time. So, yeah. you know, it, create, it can create problems sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine because, I mean... Unless you could turn it off. But, I mean, to be such a killer, you have to be... It's 24-7, 365 yeah. at the highest level. You know what I mean? You're making big money. And like I said, the lights are on you and the show's on you and you're in the main event. Like, mm-hmm. it's a lifestyle. I mean, because you fought at home here, too, right? A bunch of times. Uh, Barry. Uh, was a, uh, Walk me through a couple of these fights because it'd be... I like for people at home to kind of understand. Well, early in my pro career, like I said, I quit the amateurs. I didn't go to the Olympics. I had no, no sponsorship. So I actually lived in a gym at Keelan Lawrence for about two and a half, three years. Um, lived inside the gym, worked as a bus boy at Casey's, took the subway and bus to work to, you know, to keep, to have money to survive. Like my parents, we don't come from a lot of money. They didn't give me money and stuff like that. So I started at the very bottom. Um, and Adrian Tudorescu, who was Lennox's Lewis Olympic coach, mm-hmm. he managed me, he let me live there. He got me fights. But if you check my box rec, a lot of my first, 14 fights. I was going to other guys' hometown, going to England, going to Edmonton to fight the legend, Scotty Olsen. Mm. Um, so, you know, I had to build my career, you know, the the hard way. I had no fights given to me. But after I won the title in England in Harley Pool, in the guy's hometown was undefeated, then everyone was like, holy shit, this kid's fuck, he's a world champion. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and then Casino Rama jumped on board with TSN and Alan Tremblay, really pushed things. It was a lot easier to, mm. to sell a world champion. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, you had a good pro, a good pro career. Yeah, um, I had a very successful pro career. Like mm-hmm. for me, like I reached a lot of the goals that I wanted to reach. Um, obviously, I lost. That's part of the game. But you know, I fought for world titles. I fought in front of my kids. I won a world title, which I always wanted to do. So mm-hmm. I'm very satisfied with the way that played out. Yeah. What are you doing? These, what are you doing these days? Um, now, so after I was done boxing, my last fight, I fought Carl Frampton. I took a year off boxing. Unfortunately, me and my wife got divorced. Um, we were living in Woodstock at the time. She moved here to London, and I moved to Kitchener. I'm a, I'm, right now, I'm an operations manager at Triple M Metal. It's a scrap metal recycler. Mm-hmm. But even there, I started at the very, very bottom, <clears throat> strapping TVs to skids outside, shoveling snow at the very bottom, and I worked my way up. They sponsored me when I was, when I was fighting, when I had the uh, unification with Caballero. They're good people. It's a family business. Mm-hmm. It's massive, but... You know, that's what I do now every day. I love it. It's very stable. I'm comfortable. So mm-hmm. I'm very happy with it. Yeah, because uh, um, the reason, I, I, another reason why you're on the podcast too is because um, a lot of these MMA guys um, are, are actually reaching out to you to develop their hands. Like, how do you feel about the transition of these, uh, of, of mixed martial artists reaching out to the professional boxer to develop their hands? I think it's a great thing. I think it's smart, um, you know, the hands are one of those things that can always be worked, and who, who better to do it with than you? Um, yeah, I've trained a few guys. I, I've trained with CLB here in London. I've been mm-hmm. training my buddy Zach Junkin, who will be on your card He's in making December. his debut with me on December 6th. My yeah. boy Zach, yeah. I've been training him for a few years. He's a really good guy. And I've worked with guys in the past at Extreme Couture. I used to spar with Alec Ricci a lot. Mm-hmm. Alex um, Ricci fought for me 
um, long time ago, actually. You can ask him some yeah, stories. Because yeah. I used to, because I was fourth at Austin wrestling. So I'd be like, hey, you know what, Alex? We can shoot in. You can choke me out. There's no kick in her knee, but we can, you know, have an MMA fight and we shoot in on each other. How do you and like that? I loved it. Really? I lo- I want you to ask him about those stories. I'll tell yeah. you. I loved it. No shit. Um, and I boxed with um, Hominick before mm-hmm. and um, was it Hordecki? Yeah, Hominick and Hordecki came down. We just did just boxing, so it wasn't fair to them, but mm-hmm. they're amazing guys. They're great with their hands. Yeah. And in the cage, they'd, they'd crush me. Um, but they're super good at boxing, just cool guys. I remember mm-hmm. those days. They're fun days. Did you ever think about the transition to boxing? Um, at the- or, no, from boxing to MMA? At the time, I no. always wonder if guys would do that. Now, now that I that I see it, I, I like it. But back then, I was just doing so well at boxing, and the money wasn't wasn't really there at the MMA at the time it's compared to not boxing. There. <laughs> it's it's but still it's there. but it's improved night it's and day. It's getting there. It's getting there. It's 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 capturing the cu- the crowds to. I'm not sure what you know. I thought I think that what did um Hominick get when he fought Aldo. I heard a number. I don't know if it's. I accurate. heard a number too. I heard it's twelve and twelve. I'm like, Are you I heard kidding? six and six, bro. I heard twelve and twelve. That's what I heard. But he got fight of the night at like seventy five k. Which is crazy. Which is that. fine because the guy's a fucking warrior. I don't know if I can swear on this. You can swear all the fuck you want, bro. Because <laughs> I have a horrible mouth. No, but the guy's a fucking warrior. Fights his brain, his heart out with that big thing on his head at that time. Yeah. Um, and I love the guy, and he had a great fight with one of the greatest MMA fighters yep. of all time. I'm thinking, are we going to pay the guy twelve thousand dollars for that? Look at the look at all the people here. Yeah, fifty five. I was there. Fifty five thousand. I was there as well. I was sitting there. I was with Jonathan Brookins at the time from the yeah. Ultimate Fighter. Oh no shit, eh? Yeah. Um, but I was like, that's crazy, and it broke my heart. My biggest fight was in South Africa. I'm like, I'm a hundred twenty two pound string bean fighting in South Africa, mm-hmm. no TV to America, and I was getting two forty US. 240k yeah that's crazy uh, why do you think the, the the pay structure is so different between boxing and mma i have no idea <laughs> like i, I it, i've always wondered because i'm like how do boxers make so much money i mean i guess on a pro level on a bigger stage they got more money bigger sponsors it's old money boxing yeah um on the grassroots level mma the, the it's so expensive to put on shows I, I couldn't even, it, it cost me almost that much to put on a show, never mind. And it's the same with an I was at a show on Friday and the same type of thing that you go through. Like, you know I mean? It's tough to get sponsors. You know, you got to pay fighters, medicals, flights, hotels. People don't see the expenses that you got to pay out to, to, to run a show. And then, you know, you get these young fighters ask, thinking they want big money. That's not the way it works. Mm-hmm. I wish I could. I, and because I'm, I'm at the center of it all the time, right? It's, yeah. you know, guys negotiating contracts and. Before I fought for my first world title, I think I was 22 and 0. I fought at the docks. It was at, I don't know if it was a charity for the fight network. I fought for $1,500. Mm-hmm. 500, which, 500, which had to go to Russ Amber because he came to wrap my hands. And then I had to piece a couple hundred off to some other trainers. So I got like $800 take home. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 13 months later, for my first world title fight, I got 60000 US. Wow. So they're like, just the, the range is just crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're a fighter. I mean, I mean, I know a lot of these guys. Some guys don't care what they're getting paid until they get to the position. That, Absolutely, that they it. can say, "Hey, man, I'm I'm here. I deserve to be paid this much. I've paid my dues, right?" And that's where I was at. Like I said, the fifteen hundred dollars, you know, it got me a fight. It kept me busy. Um, I think it was a fight network launch party. It was good exposure. You know what I mean? I wanted to stay active and stay under the light. So I was like, yeah, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a, a documentary. Um, yeah, Harris Usonovic, um, Bipolar Rock and Roller, which I'm sure a lot of the people viewing this. Mar- uh, is that Mauro Ranello? Mauro Ranello's okay, podcast, yeah. 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 Um, they came to me about eight months ago, him and another gentleman, Mark Herman, who used to be my manager at the end of my career. And they said, Stevie, like, we know your life story. Or Harris said, I heard about your life story. You know, could we go for dinner one time? And I was like, yeah, man, no problem. So we went for dinner, had a chat. And I'm an open book. I'll sit here and tell you anything you want to know. I have nothing to hide. And he's like, I'd, I'd like to do a documentary on him. I'm like, all right. Mm-hmm. So what kind of things do they ask you? What kind of Can you give us a kind of uh, um, a, a brief synopsis of? Just my, my whole life, like just the turnaround of my whole life from what we talked about earlier, where I started, mm-hmm. where I be, where I, what I became in the boxing world, where I am now, mm-hmm. plus the situation with my brother, how that affected my life and affected everything. How did that affect you? I mean, <clears throat> if anybody don't know, how, do you want to explain to us what um, happened? It just turned my whole world upside down. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I know it's not about me, and I don't want anything to ever be about me, but it fucked up my life horribly. Yeah, I can, uh, I mean. You know, somebody who raised me from when I was, like, especially in the boxing world, was at, you know, 
took care of me, took care of me, took care of me, took care of me. And then when I moved to Toronto, he kind of really fucked up and he did a piece of shit move and did the worst thing possible. You know, it was, I wanted to just still finish our dream for us. Mm -hmm. and I don't support what he did. To this day, I don't speak to him. He's not allowed in my life. And that's unfortunate because that's I lost my best friend. Yeah, I didn't yeah. do anything, right? But, you know, that's part of life. I have kids, I have a family, I have a good job. <clears throat> and that's what I focus on. I don't worry about, I don't look at my rear view. I just straight ahead. Are, are, are you, do you mind telling us what happened? Um, You know, he was just convicted of second degree murder. He murdered his ex-girlfriend. Um, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did something that's unforgivable and unforgettable. And Both families lost, bro. Yeah, that's... more so about them. All this, like, again, I don't want mm -hmm. that to be about me, but yeah, I lost somebody mm -hmm. that raised me where were you in your career when that happened um i was it was may of 2012 i just beat scotty olsen for the canadian title knocked him out in the fifth round in edmonton alberta and yeah so that happened in in may mm -hmm. so well, i was like 11 and 0 i think at the time or 10 and 0 wow where were you at the time when um, you heard the news i was i was in my one bedroom apartment i finally got my first sponsor u.s traffic who gave me a thousand dollars a month was covered a one bedroom apartment for rent down the street from Jim. And my father just called me and just let me know what was up. And I was like, What the fuck? And he's like, I gotta come get you. And uh. and I drank a lot. I did a lot of drugs. Mm -hmm. And then my dad came and got me and then, you know, over the years that whole situation just fucked me up beyond belief. Mm -hmm. Are you still recovering from it now? Oh, every day is just a nightmare. Like, it's something that'll, that'll be with me forever, mm -hmm. whether I like it or not. You know what I mean? Especially when I was doing well in boxing. Mm -hmm. That was the first question brought up all the time. Um, people always wanted to, to talk about it and to ask me about it, even though I, I used to beg. I'd be like, listen, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. <coughs> but this didn't stop. So mm -hmm. then I was just, I became rebellious a little bit. You know, I was doing, you know, I was just, I was living the wrong life at, at mm -hmm. the time. But when it came for boxing, I never lived the wrong life. When I signed a contract, drugs, partying, done. everything was done. You were focused. Cold determined. turkey. And people never people couldn't believe it. They're like, that's fucked up, dude, that mm. you can live like that. And then this, the next day, you're like that. Yeah. Turn it around. And then finally after, and part of the documentary is about like, when you're a world champion, you go to the doctor and you say, oh, my hand's a little bit sore. Especially back then before opiates became the problem that they were now. Yeah. They were giving up scripts like they were crazy, like they were Tic Tacs. Yeah. Um, so, they still yeah. do that. They, they're still pumping but, people through with pills. Yeah, but I don't. it wasn't as easy as, as a, accessible, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Like, it was easy for me. Um, and I used to do, I really got hooked on the painkillers. By the end, <clears throat> after I lost to Cavalero, it was a big eye-opener. It was my first loss, the biggest stage on Showtime. And then I lost, and I did a lot of drugs hard for like two or three weeks. My ex-wife was pregnant at the time. I remember my promoter called her, <coughs> and his name was Alan Trombley, and I could hear her in the other room, but he asked her, like, how's Stevie doing? And she was just crying. My wife, <coughs> at the time, nine months pregnant, and she, like, she just started crying. She goes, she hasn't moved in two weeks off the couch. I did move, like, from the couch to the bathroom, to the couch to the bathroom, just to to do drugs and part mm -hmm. and just numb my pain and you know with with the oxy and stuff like that but i remember that night we were at the penthouse no yeah i think we lived yeah we lived in a condo at the time and i just remember i took all the i had a bunch of drugs that i had oxys and stuff and i just went down to the chute so like i oh, don't flush them on the toilet because you might recover some i went to the garbage chute threw them around the thing before my son was born Jan in January 5th, 2009, I haven't touched any You've been cocaine, oxy. Clean since. Clean as a whistle. Kids change, eh? Kids change. He said, I tell my son, and he doesn't understand, like, you saved daddy's life. The savior, yeah. You yeah. saved daddy's life. Wow. Gives you something to fight for. A different kind of fight now. You know, I still, now that marijuana is legal, it's not a drug like that. We were that. just talking about this. We just had a, I just had a podcast with Elias Theodoro, and uh, we touched base on medicinal marijuana and how it keeps him from jumping into the opiates and you know taking pills and falling down that path because it's it's it can take yourself for example you could take a world-class athlete 
and then with some pain pain management pills, all of a sudden it, everything can spiral out of control for you. I mean, you've obviously been hit with some tragedy. Your, your family has been hit with some tragedy, so that's a, another underlying issue for that to happen to you as well. But you persevered. Most people don't do that, man. Like to have kids, some people don't change. You should. Be, and that's what the, and that's what the Harris when he came to me is like. I can't believe because he's talking to people about me and people know how I used to be and know my story and stuff like that. And he's mm -hmm. like, it's just crazy. And then to transition. You know, like I said, where you're making a lot of money and you don't got to worry about bills, too, where you got to go into work for 6.30 and be there till 4.30 and be in the snow, or sunshine, rain, and work every day a regular job. And when you start at the bottom, you're getting a paycheck for like a 1000 bucks. You're like, what? Mm -hmm. This is I, not something that you My, my training to. camp fee was $25,000. Wow. What's $1,000 for so, two weeks' work? So just a quick question on, on the pay when you get paid that much money to do a fight how much of that is gone to to train like what does that training cost for someone to to, to build up a world training trained athlete um so say if i get a check for a hundred thousand mm -hmm. um they don't they don't tax you they say there's your money mm -hmm. so first of all revenue in canada when you make up one hundred twenty thousand dollars, they take 44 percent of the biggest pigs out there so 44 percent of your purse is gone which is basically half I was self-managed, but a lot of managers today take 20%. Mm -hmm. I always paid my trainer, Chris, 10%, and I'd give my, my cut man two, two and a half percent. Mm -hmm. But plus, if you get a sponsor for training camp, then, you know, it's not a fee out of your your your, your purse, mm -hmm. which I'd always get a sponsor, to, you know, to cover my training camp, bring in sparring partners, hotel, food, whatever, and supplements, massage, and stuff like that. But, you know, I mean, a lot of fighters... Well, for me, it was roughly a lot less than half. If I made 100 grand, you know, 40 was for me. Wow. That's crazy. You don't think of it that the way. The tax man's the worst. Man. They are the man. The tax you can't dodge the, the tax man. Worst. It's crazy. It wow. is crazy. You ever, uh, so you're training guys, do you ever think about jumping back full full steam <laughs> ahead? Like what's, um, like I, I see I your face lights up when I talk <laughs> about it. When I say, hey, you want to train guys again? And then all of a sudden you, you get this glimmer. I mean. I, like I said, I work out every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and I train guys and I spar and I spar with Zach and I, and I like to play around. But, at 40 years old, like, you know, I mean, I did well on box. I wouldn't want to, to to ruin what I did by trying to come out of my cut. I'm out of retirement at 40 years old like, mm -hmm. and look stupid. No, no, I, I don't think you have to, my opinion. I, oh. I think I think I think you've already stamped who you are. Yeah, I'm good with that. You, you should be good with that. Yeah, I'm good with I that. I mean, like, pass that on to other people. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I train with my kids. Every time they come down, I, I bring them to the gym. I train people at the gym um, in Kitchener, the rec room. I trained Zach there. Mm -hmm. um, CLBs came a couple of times. And just some other young kids to, uh, at the gym had to go to. I always just want to just, just pass it on. I go to fights all the time. I just had a fight on Friday. Mm -hmm. I saw pictures of you with uh, Dylan Carmen. Yeah, yeah big, big country. He's huge, big country. Eh? He's huge. He's a good guy. He's yeah, wild. Great guy. But I, he was, I was, we were together at the start and he's seen me rise and he's seen my work ethic and he respects me because he knows like when it came to the gym, Steve does not fuck around. Mm -hmm. He'll spar everyone and you got to work hard. There's no playing around. You take this shit serious. And he's my, he's my boy and he's a hard worker. He did well for himself. He's a great speaker. You see my big brother. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's a great fighter as well. And he's a, he's a good dude. He's my boy. Yeah. I watched, uh, I think I saw him fight, um, uh, Rico center. Rico Center, yeah. That was uh, three Canadian. three years ago, I think it was, and I think he fought a uh, uh, Mel Big Mel, or was it Roddick? Roddick, Razor, Razor Roddick. Roddick. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. he ended Razor, and Roddick. he ended Razor Roddick, which was yeah. sad to see because. But again, Razor Roddick at forty or forty five, it is like still dangerous. Still dangerous. It's Razor Roddick. <laughs> you don't think so? Not for these young cats, bro. Yeah, not, it's not. It's night different, and day. Different level. Different level. Do, do you find the the boxers coming up now are different than how you used to be? Um, Your era of guys. I do. Like I think that. Um, Back in my day, it was a little bit tougher. Like, you know, you see these guys, you know, they're more worried about their Facebook videos mm -hmm. that they want to put on Facebook. Social and, media. And then getting there and grinding it out and mm -hmm. working hard. But there is still a lot of good hard workers and a, and a lot of good athletes, a lot of good up-and-coming boxers. Lucas Bahati, who I think is a great prospect. Kane here. And there's a lot of good prospects mm -hmm. in Ontario that can be future world champions mm -hmm. here in the province. Yeah. Do you know Mark uh, Petkali One Gun? I know Mark. We used to actually... We, we used to work together a little bit, um, and he was managed by a guy. I just, the manager, Mark Irwin, said, hey, Stevie, can you come, can you help Mark out? He's a southpaw. Mm -hmm. um, he's close. You know, he he looks up to you. Can you spar him? Like, or train him? I'm like, yeah, I can train with him. And he lived in Toronto, so 
you make arrangements to train and whatnot. But then Mark, I know that Mark went to California and he ran mm-hmm. with Pacquiao and then he got hooked up with the uh, Garcias and stuff like that. And he wanted to leave Mark as a manager, which I was fine with. I don't mm-hmm. like that's business. I have no idea, but that's between you guys. I'm just doing a favor for Mark. Mm-hmm. I was a little bit choked and felt disrespected that Mark didn't say, hey, Steve, I'm going in this direction. Thank you for all your help and thank you for driving to Royal York to coach me. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. I didn't get any phone call or no sort of message or nothing like that, which I kind of felt disrespected, but he's a young kid. He's learned the business. I understand that. I don't really hold that against him. I think, I think uh, he had a rough road. I think boxing in general is, is, is a rough road. It's yes. a very rough road. You get a lot of people that with their hands out, a lot of people trying to uh, manipulate you. You're broke. You're, you're tired. You're, yeah. you, it's, it's always a very, very tough. It's road. a tough life, man. It's not. It it's not what it's all cracked. And that's why, I like, I could have been like, "Oh, fuck you!" You know, you, you know, you should have been. You know, you should have at least called me or said somebody. Like, he's a, he was a young kid. He was new to the pro game. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he was dealing with the Brandon Rio thing. He was leaving that. I manager. bet he doesn't know that. And you know what? He that's probably what I thought. Know. Like, he's, you know, he, he probably didn't even. He's such a young kid. And he had so much going on. He just probably wasn't conscious of it. That's why I've never said anything bad about him. Because he's a great lash guy. out him. He's a super like nice he's dude. like that when I talk. He's a blue belt in jujitsu now. Oh, is he? Yeah. No, I seen. I did see some yeah. uh, pictures on Facebook. Yeah. I know he got he's, married recently. Yep, or last and, uh, year. Carol, uh, Carolyn. Has, yes. Yeah, he's a he's a beautiful soul. That guy. Yeah. I, I I think, um, I'd like for him to reach out to you on that because I don't I I would, it bothers me that you would have that taste in your mouth. I don't have it. Okay. Like I like yeah. I think for me I accepted he's a the good, fact he's a great guy. I accepted the fact that you know what he's a young kid. He probably. Wasn't even something that at, at that age he was like twenty four, like twenty three, with all that stuff going on. Like he probably didn't even understand, like or even probably think not. about it. Like I'm not. sure if he did, he probably like, oh fuck, Molly. Like yeah, I'm sorry. Like yeah, we like, I'm thank you. Like this is what I'm going in. And I wish he would have reached out to to say, hey Stevie, because in the end, I don't think that deal and that thing really panned out. Mm-hmm. Like going to the state side for him or whatever it was he did. Yeah, they, I don't think they ever, they sell you a dream. They do, and look at me. I got sued for ten million dollars. Mm-hmm. Oh, when wow. I I was already fighting at Rama, we had <clears throat> um my cut man was dealing with a promoter, Murad Muhammad, who had Manny Pacquiao before and he, he was a big promoter back in the day, and he's like, Oh, that hundred grand you're getting for every fight at Rama's, you should be getting more than that. And I didn't have a contract at the, at the time with my promoter, so I was like, Well, I'm open to ideas. Like if you want, you know, you want to show me some paperwork and put some on paper, like we can do mm-hmm. that. And that didn't pan out. But then people just start firing off lawsuits for for millions of dollars. Like, what the fuck? Wow. See, I think a lot of time, I think I think athletes and fighters in general need somebody to oversee their contracts. Absolutely. Because, uh, in my experience, just seeing the MMA guys and, and and signing contracts, they don't read it. No. They don't look at it thoroughly. Money, and, date, wait, sign. Who? Yeah. And, then, and sometimes not even the who. Yeah. And and and. and it's not good that way because there's people that would manipulate that yeah. and go and, and take advantage of the fighter and take advantage of who they are. Yeah. And, and it's not fair. I think you, you should act well, nobly. You, you signed with me for three years. You can't go fight on that, on that on with those people either and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it needs to be more transparency, but at the same time, it, it's due diligence on the fighter side as well. It's I for mean, both. Yeah. Promoter yeah. and, and fighter. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of the contract is, yeah. is, to lay out the lines of protection for each person. Here's what it is. Involved. You yeah. want to join? Yes. Okay. But you'd be surprised how many guys don't read it. I'm not surprised. I've seen him boxing. Yeah. They just go, oh, cool. Because they get excited. Yeah. And that's why uh, having good handlers, good managers, good coaches, good people. Hey, Mark himself even you know, came to me before. He's like, hey, I got a con- I go, Let me see your contract. Have you read it? No. Uh, you got to go through Bring it to a lawyer. And there's, yeah, bring it to a lawyer because there's trickery in there. Yeah. They know how to manipulate the word. Yeah. So I. Like my advice to anybody, you know, signing contracts and, and going into the fight game to really read what you're signing. Yeah, absolutely. Take the time. There's no rush, you know. There's no rush. And if, if they want to sign, they'll wait. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let's jump into your boxing career a little bit. What was the toughest fight for you? <laughs> Obviously, on paper, people are like, oh, fuck, Caballero, he knocked you in the fourth round. Mm-hmm. But for me... That's not always the toughest fight, though. It wasn't the toughest fight, and it wasn't... I'm not going to say fair, but that was a time... <clears throat> So that whole promoter thing, when I tried to leave my promoter, they're like, okay, we'll take you back and you can fight Arama for your hundred grand because all that big money was just smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. I talked, Don King physically called my phone. He said, can you come down to Florida? I'd like to see you. He goes, hundred thousand is good money. I don't even think I could pay more than that. I talked to Bob Arum, same thing. He goes, that's good money, kid. You know, you should stay there. That's your hometown. Mm -hmm. Bob Arum gave me the, he goes, stay. 
because I can't even give you more than that. Israel Don't Vasquez care. got eighty thousand dollars to fight Oscar Larios two months after we had that conversation. Mm-hmm. So, um, but they said part of the deal is because Chris tried to lure you away. Chris isn't part of the deal, and me and Chris were good, man. Me and mm-hmm. Chris were so good together. We had built who I was, world champion, like untouchable. So I went. I had a. I got a new trainer. It was in Montreal. My wife was pregnant. I was living in Montreal. I had a new trainer. Our, our vibe, our connection just wasn't there. Like you can't get a connection that fast. It takes years to build something. We have a nice flow, and you feel confident. And I didn't have that for the Caballero fight. Not to say that he didn't deserve to win, and, and he was better than me because he was. He will be. He was a better man than I met on the night. I'm not making an excuse, but I just think that the fight would have been different if it was with me and Chris and the and the, the streak that we were on. Mm-hmm. If they would, the plug wouldn't got pulled like that. I think it would have been a little bit different, but. My toughest fight was a guy nine and nine, Steve Trumbull. I fought him in Montreal in a four rounder. He was tough. Mm-hmm. He was a big tough dude, and he was nine and nine, but he was a journeyman. And sometimes those guys are just tough, man. And I was like, "Fuck, this guy's tough." Wow, you're grueling. Yeah. If you had your time back, well, would you do things differently? Um, if you had a time machine right now, and you can go back in time. Obviously, you know we we'd fix certain things, but yeah, career wise, career wise, um, I would have. Kept Chris, mm-hmm. Chris Johnson. That is that is number one. I wouldn't have changed anything else. I had a great promoter. I had good people around me, good handlers. I had everything was good. You know, I liked I liked the rough start that I had because when I moved into Adrian's gym at 19 years old, I went in there a boy, but I definitely left as a man. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, living in the gym, crying yourself to sleep. You know, your friends are in college, university, living a life, having fun. And you're supposed to be a professional athlete who lives in the boxing gym and works as a busboy at Casey's. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of me becoming who I became. It really turned me into a man, so I would never change that. Um, You know, I had a few trainers along the way, but when me and Chris got together, like, it was, was, we were on top. It was a good match. Yeah, man, it was crazy. He was, you know, Olympic, I don't know if you know Chris Johnson, Olympic bronze medalist. He was decent. He's a pretty pretty good pro, um, but a great coach. The people around you are what really defines you, man. They say, Absolutely. like, a, you know, you want to see where you're going to be in five years, surround yourself with so who you're with now. And if you're with them in five years, you'll see. You. Yeah. You ever hear that expression? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I know that. You, know, know you, you want to be a millionaire, surround yourself with millionaires. Yeah. You know, you want to be a bum, be with bums. And Chris really gave me the <laughs> confidence that I needed. But, you know, like I said, he was a, you know, he lived in the States for a while in Atlanta. He's been around the James Tonys and all those guys. He grew up with, with Lennox Lewis. And, mm-hmm. you know, he knew what it took. And he, and he got me there mentally and physically. You know, he was mm-hmm. great. You know Lennox Lewis very well? Um, I know him enough. Like, I'm sure if he saw me, he would know who I was. And mm-hmm. We would talk. And we've met hundreds of times. We've been at events together and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Good, great guy. Cheap as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, <laughs> we're at a store at 5 and 10, which is uh, in Mississauga. And he's got some hair product for his dreads at the time. And... He's like, why is it so expensive? Like, it's made, it's made here in Canada. I'm like, Lennox, it's twenty one fifty. Your Bentley's parked outside. <laughs> you got a Bentley outside. Of you. <laughs> like you're 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 stressing over two bucks, but he's like, why is it so expensive? It's That's made worse. in Canada. <laughs> Lennox is cheap. He's cheap, but he's a, he's a good guy. He's loyal. Yeah. He's, he's a good father. Um, and you know he's a fuck. He's a legend. He's, he's huge, a legend. Man. He's, huge. I, he's I, huge. He was another one I got starstruck. I I, I met him. Um, it was at the Rico Center. It was the night of yeah. that fight. Because it was him and uh, Lee, uh, not Lee Baxter. Uh, Lee Baxter did does do a lot of shows. He there. does do a lot of shows, but it was uh, Les Woods. Les Woods, you are right. So Les, Les Woods and, yeah. and Legacy Lennox. Promotions. That's right. Yeah. And then and I saw him, and <clears throat> I was starstruck because I was like, holy, it's fucking Lennox Lewis. And I was like this far away from him, and I, and I, I just went, I had Lennox. And then and he, he looked, and he... It was like a half smile. I just wanted this, like not in my head. And he just, he nodded. His, and I, that was all I needed. But I was like, it's not every day you get to run into champions. It's not every day you get, you know. And when I was living at the gym, because Adrian Tudorescu, he's dead. He passed away now. May he rest in peace. He was, uh, he was Lennox's coach when Lennox won the gold. And he would always come to the gym whenever he was in town. And he'd watch me spar. And he'd talk with me and him and Adrian. We would play chess for fucking hours. Yeah, because he talked about, I heard him on the Joe Rogan show talking yeah. about how he plays chess and he's like competitive yeah. ch- chess player. Do you, What do you do outside of boxing, bro? What do you, um, I just like to work out. I like to, to, to hang with my kids. I like to, I like to run. 
I'm a very simple guy, bro. Mm. I just relax, work out. I work a lot. Um, at the scrapyard, I work a lot, long hours, but that keeps me busy, and, and I love it. I go to the gym every day. I train a few clients mm. who are fight and fighting the MMA world and stuff like that, and just both most yeah. of my kids. How come you don't open, open up a gym? <clears throat> well, you know as well as I do. Maybe it's a little bit different now, but back in the day, boxing was a, a place for poor kids who couldn't afford, afford hockey. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a lot of money. You don't walk into too many gyms. The UFC facility in Vegas is obviously different, but mm -hmm. a lot of boxing gyms in Ontario, it's not fancy and nice. And you know what I mean? It's not, it's just not a draw the way it is. I'm at a, I'm at a gym now that I train up the rec room. It's a fitness facility, CrossFit facility, and, and there's a little boxing facility upstairs that, that I do. But to open your own spot, it's tough, man. Mm -hmm. It's a tough business to make it in. The fight world's a tough business to make it in. It is, man. It's a definite grind. Yeah. But I can totally see you. I would love. I would love that. it. I would I mean, love ideally, it. Ideally, I would love it. But like, I have kids. I have a, I have mm. a very good career. I'm very comfortable at my place where I work. But and I like doing my little thing on the side, um, at the gym that I'm at. But to go full bore and just have a straight gym is just, mm. it's a big risk. You you watch fights now? You still like in? I never stop watching fights. Like I was up last night, just like trying to stay awake. I watched Kovalev. I watched Diaz. Yeah. I watched. Every boxing match. I love boxing. Yeah, I missed the Kovalev. What happened in the Kovalev fight? Um, Kovalev was what old. We, what we all anticipated? I don't know what you anticipated. Huh? What did you anticipate? Him losing? Kovalev? Yeah. Yeah, he, and I thought he was old before that, but he got real old last mm. night. And, you know, Canelo put him to sleep. Canelo, I've always liked Canelo. He's Canelo's a, great a different beast, man. He is, but he's no Mayweather. I know a lot of people don't like Mayweather. I love Mayweather. He's the man. I do love Mayweather. He's the man. Yeah, I think he's probably one of the best boxers ever. He's the he man. just moved. You never hit him. And people can complain and say this and that. Beat him. Be beat him and then talk. Beat him and then, yeah, then yeah. you can say something. But Pacquiao didn't get close in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Canelo didn't get close. Do you think that the fight was too late, though? Um, Pacquiao, Pacquiao, absolutely. Yeah. I think it would have been different, but same result. Really? Mayweather went absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. Although a lot of people are probably going to be screaming at me. Go, you're fucking wrong. Pacquiao's, Pacquiao's a killer five years prior by... No, I don't. You can't touch Mayweather, man. That, that was his life from, and you see the picture with the with the gloves. That's all he knows. He's not gonna yeah. lose. Yeah, he's not. He changed his whole persona when he went money way, mother, and things changed for him. He did. When he became his own boss, he left Bob Aaron. Way better. Things really changed. Way better. Yeah. And you know, he made the. You can't knock the guy. Like he made a lot more money. Yeah. Smart. Without Bob Aaron, and yeah, very smart. Yeah. And he's still together, like his brain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, he st still talks well. You know, what I mean. Likes to gamble, mm -hmm. loves the women. You ever meet him? Oh yeah, I met Floyd. How was that? Times. He's a good dude. I remember we we're at a weigh-in. He fought in uh, Grand Rapids. The only time Floyd Mayweather ever got dropped, I was there. He, so he fought in Floyd in uh, Grand Rapids. Sorry, fuck, I can't think of the guy who fought. But anyways, we're at the weigh-ins, and there's eight pairs of gloves they got to try on after you weigh-in just to see which pair you want to fight with, and you pick a spare pair. And I'm standing there, and he's right there, and he's trying on. He's like, oh. It's over. It's over. <laughs> the next day, fights on, fights on, fights on. Hits the guy. Hurts his hand so bad that he has to take a knee and take his only eight count. And every time being knocked down in his life. But I was like, fuck, man. You shouldn't have been been so cocky. Banging yeah. the glove in front of me wow. saying it's over because he hurt his hand that it's bad. It's over for his hand. <laughs> yeah. He took a knee and had his only knockdown of his whole career that night. And, and that was night. because of the because glove of his in his hand. hand. Yeah. But still doesn't. To me, in my eyes, it doesn't count as a... No, an official knockdown. No, absolutely. He took a knee not. because he hurt his hand. But there's some book where I'm out there and being like, "Oh no, he's been knocked down one time before. It's documented right here in this book." Yeah, but it's not. That's not. It's not, not the same. No. Yeah, he's definitely the best, bro. He's yeah. the best. Any other? Uh... And he works. Listen to me. He works hard, mm -hmm. hard, hard, hard. Like there's no one. Like it's crazy the way that man works in the gym. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know Dr. Faisal. Very well. Yeah. How do you know him? Um. Obviously through the MMA and the fight world, but back in my day, he was, I think he was not really involved, involved as not near as much as he is now. Obviously I know he's mm -hmm. doing his big thing out there, but just, um, through, through that boxing world, I need to get some medicals done and we talked and we stayed in touch and we still stay in touch through Facebook and, mm -hmm. you know, he's a great guy. I know he does a lot of charity events. I know he trains and he fights and he's the greatest doctor, like, Guys yeah. a rock See, star. <laughs> even even Faisal, man, he's just yeah. we all owe a lot, owe 
shit ton of, to this guy. I mean, a ton. Because people have no idea. Go here to get this. Go here to get this. Go here to go with this. Get here to go with this. Oh, you need this. You forgot to get this. Mm-hmm. That's that a, expired. That's now you got to do it again. You got to go here and do this. Oh, when they go, you get your new appointment. Oh, now this is expired. And it costs money. And fighters are broke. Yeah. That's why when he does these charity events where all of us are all yeah. over it. Yeah, People should, helping, should yeah. really praise and be appreciative and super mm-hmm. grateful for all he does, especially here in South Wilson, Ontario, because he does a lot. Yeah, it's a shout out to Faisal. Faisal, yeah. man. So uh, I just want to go back to this documentary. When is the documentary release? Um, there's no release date yet. Um, Harris actually may have had a baby today or tomorrow or this week. His wife's ready to pop any day now. Mm-hmm. Um, so we still got a lot of shooting left to do. They've interviewed a few people um, from my from my past. They still want to get a few more people, Chris, and they want to get a time and a place where they're going to do like a big like four to six hour shoot of me, questioning mm. me and stuff like that. Are you excited about it? Nervous? <laughs> Both. Yeah. Sometimes I'm excited and sometimes I'm like, holy fuck, like, oh my God, do you really want to pull them skeletons out? Yeah, but sometimes dusting off those skeletons bro, can really help you heal. I miss that such a place now that you know, I've been through so much in my life that, you know what, here's the truth. Here's what everything is in life and here's what it is. And if you like me, great. If you don't, I'm not. Mm-hmm. Gonna, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, because you seem great. You know what I mean? I'm like, very comfortable. Very easy to talk to, very... Yeah, I'm not, better, I'm, not, I'm not better than anybody. Like, mm-hmm. like oh, you're a two-time world champion. Like, I don't give a fuck. Like, let's sit and watch this fight together. Like, I just, like I'm not better than anybody. Like, yeah, I'll mm-hmm. hold pads for you. Yeah, I'll tie your gloves. Not better than anybody. Hmm. So are you available for training? Or so if guys wanted to reach out to you, could they do that? Yeah, like my my schedule is limited. Like I said, I'm very comfortable with my job. They they've given me a great opportunity. Um, the gym I train at, like I said, they give me my own space. You know, if it if it can fit in my schedule, yeah, I'm definitely down to help. Mm-hmm. If I want to help people, I like to be involved. I like to go to fights. I'm gonna be at your guys' show December six in Windsor. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna be there. I love the fight game, so I want to be as involved as much as I can. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm. I, I really hope this documentary. I mean, even though you say it brings out the skeletons and stuff like that, I, I, I think it could give you some sort of healing too. And, and you know, that's that's for me when they came to me, and then I thought about it. I was like, this could be for me, just for me personally. Um, like, there's gonna be, there's always gonna be haters. There's always mm-hmm. gonna be haters. I've never there's, heard anything bad about you. Just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but there's gonna be haters always, no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, there's gonna be people that love you and 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 just love you, know who you are. But for me, it's gonna be like, you know what? This there's a truth. Like, fuck. Like, I'm done crying. Please, I'm done crying. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I, at at the gym that I have, like, I there's times I just put my music on, hit the bag, have tears streaming down my face, like. Mm-hmm. I mean, now why the tears? Just like this, in my life people don't really <clears throat> always know the truth, or they hear half truths, mm-hmm. or they they think certain. What's things. the biggest stigma? What's a what's an uh, um, a non truth that's been kind of circulating that just maybe the, you can just, clear up now? Just the the fact that people thought that I supported the crime that my brother did, or encouraged it, or. Or, or love that in any way, shape, or form. That is not the case mm-hmm. in any way, shape, or form. And part of the documentary, they're going to pay big money to get, um, I don't forget what it's called, but they got to pay money if you want to get from the archives. Mm-hmm. In the Ring Magazine, the biggest boxing magazine on planet Earth, I was like, I'd give up everything in my life, my career that I have at this point, and stay in the street naked to just erase that. Mm-hmm. Um I never supported the crime my brother did. I was just... Because you wore a, a t-shirt, right? I wore a t-shirt with his name on it, but that was just because I finally had reached the plateau that, you know, that since we were nine, since I was nine years old, and he was getting me up to go run before school, and he was at the gym, and he was helping me, and he always had my back. You know, I was just like, hey, bro, like, I'm going to finish this for us. I'm going to finish our dream mm-hmm. that we always had growing up for 10 years, and, you know what I mean, you are always looking out for me and had my back and stuff like that. It wasn't too condone what the fuck he did like are you crazy like listen mm-hmm. bro and he knows and and the world knows and i don't give a fuck you stay in jail forever or they execute you there's nothing else in between you take a life you give a life and that is it mm-hmm. and that's the way i feel about it mm-hmm. is it hard to feel that way no you mm-hmm. make your bed you lie in it mm-hmm. and that's that i don't care who you are mm-hmm. I, I, i'm not saying anything bad about it i'm just looking at a different perspective because if i look at my daughter for example. oh absolutely for from other people's thing and when i look back if i could change only one thing in my life it'd be from wearing that shirt mm-hmm. because everything else has got me to here 
I have my kid at my job. I wouldn't want to change anything, but just wearing that. But the shirt wasn't necessarily you wasn't saying, saying hey, I, I support what you did. No, it was, I'm fulfilling but, our dream. But people obviously took it as that, and, and that was my mistake. Mm. I mean, I had a, I, my world went from upside down. Like I said, I went from fighting from $1,500 to $60,000 to having MTV Cribs at your house to being on Chill Magazine and doing this and doing that. Like, my life did a fucking whirlwind as well. Mm. You know what I mean, from... You know, watching your bank account to being like, yep, 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 yep. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Things, life changes so quick. That's amazing how, like, uh, a family member can change things for you. And it's because it's not you. It wasn't you. Yeah. You know. It's definitely fucked up. Wow. <laughs> but like I said, processes to heal. That's, you know? you know what I mean, like I said, I'm almost 40 years old. And part of the reason that I said I, uh, I'm agreeing to this documentary and just all access to everything is just to... Just to get, you know, the facts out there. Mm-hmm. It's important too. Uh, it's important for for yourself, for myself mostly. For your for your family, for your kids. I want to be. I want to be. I want my kids to understand. Mm-hmm. And I just want to be able to be the best father I am to them without having that always just kind of hindering me. Mm-hmm. Do you think you'll ever escape that? Probably not. I think you will. I hope so. It's there. I, I mean, <clears throat> people are different these days, man. They, they, I think, when people are honest and open and transparent. And they show their real thoughts and feelings. People go, "Oh, I get it." Now we have more platforms to share. Yeah, we have more access with Facebook I mean? and, and stuff like this and podcasts and everything. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see. Time mm-hmm. will tell. Yeah, I think it will. I'm excited for it. I hope so. I'm yeah, excited I, for the I, documentary. I think it's good for you. I really do. I think I think you should do. I think you should go at this with a full open heart i've already committed to like i said they've been at my house and we've done a few mm-hmm. small shoots but not the main interview and i've i, I the truth's out there like and mm-hmm. there's a there's an article i don't know if you've seen it last year with morgan campbell the toronto sun Mm-mm. about my about more that was more so about the drugs and and the stuff like that it was a 10-year anniversary to my first loss to cavalero but it focused on like my drug abuse and stuff in between fights and stuff like mm-hmm. that when you read stuff like that how does that make you feel um for that i was proud because listen to me i was deep i was deep into doing a lot of drugs um and when you're the two-time world champion and you have per- people around you like not businessmen but more street men mm-hmm. you know it's, it's very accessible hey champ like we love you you're doing good and when oxycontin was in a major epidemic it was everywhere it was everywhere there's there's a bottle there's a bottle you know i mean you're getting four grand worth of bottles for free for nothing mm-hmm. <coughs> I don't help a drug problem. No. <laughs> um, so being famous, they get all that shit for free. Yeah. It's even worse. Yeah. That's and that's the truth. Like mm-hmm. yeah, people are like, hey, Jam, it's me. I'm, there you go, bro. But um, they're not doing you any favors. No, but at the time, like you know, what I mean, you don't you don't think like that. You're like, mm-hmm. fuck, you know, what I mean, I gotta go to camp in two weeks, so I got two weeks left to finish this. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. But you're clean now. But I'm clean, and you know, what I mean, that's that's to me is bigger than being a two thousand oh, thousand percent, bro. I, I think like that's my biggest accomplishment in life. And just the way I did it, like my, my ex-wife broke my heart at the time when she was crying. It hurt me. My son, my firstborn son was in her stomach. I'm like, fuck it. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Well, wow, good for you, bro. And I've never touched it again. It's never been a thought. And over the 10 years, I've been par- uh, to parties where there's blow and shit around. Absolutely. But it makes me feel even better that I have this. Like, oh, no, it's yeah. not for me. Yeah. A man coming from such discipline. Yeah, you can do anything, bro. Literally, Absolutely. that is true. Literally, you can do true. anything. I do. I tell that to my kids. I'm like, there's nothing you can't do in this fucking world. If you want to do something, there's nothing you mm-hmm. can't do. It just comes down to it. Take a little bit longer. You may have to work a little bit harder. Yep. But there's nothing. Make that you conscious can't do. decision to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you, bro. Uh, you never ever put your head down, bro. I don't, I don't <laughs> think you ever have to. I really don't. I think you should keep your head high, and I think you should uh, keep doing what you're doing. I think opening up about everything is is very beneficial to your recovery and in, in, in as a person as a human being as a whole and you should be, you should be very proud of that man I just, I just do my best you know what I mean yeah okay um let's, let's wrap this up because I know we we all kind of got a, a tight schedule I'm happy you came in I'm really excited uh, and when that uh, documentary drops um give it to me man I'll share it post it around and I hope everyone Absolutely. watches it and then uh, we can catch up with December 6th, Windsor, Ontario. Yes. Uh, December 6th at the St. Dennis Center, Prospect Fighting Championships 12. We, uh, you'll be uh, 
Steve Molitor will be in the house. Uh, he's cornering Zach Junkin. Uh, it's a great fight, too. I'm excited. He's making, he just came off a, a, a quick knockout win uh, over in Michigan, I believe. Um, so he's making his pro debut with me, and I'm excited. Faisal helped him another. See how everything kind of goes full circle. Absolutely. He told me. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. So Faisal just did his, uh, helped him with his medicals on Friday. That just passed. We did a photo shoot Friday evening, and uh, he should have a fresh poster coming up. So nice. I'm excited. Tell everyone where we can find you. Um, I, I, work, I, I live in Kitchener. I work at, I mean, I uh, train Social people. media. Um, just Steve Molitor on my Facebook, uh, Molitor Steven on uh, Instagram. I'm not, I'm not into all that shit, just Facebook. You should, because people should reach out to you. People should train, <laughs> develop their hands. It's, it's you're a veteran, hey, man. I'm on Facebook. I train people at the rec room. Um, the rec room's on all of our social media. Um, but now they can contact Jamie if they want to get a hold of me. Yeah, if you need to. <laughs> 10% me, man, fee for the connection. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'll help you out, man, as much as I can. Thank you so much for coming hey, in, man. Much I respect, truly appreciate my friend. it. And uh, uh, let's do this again. Absolutely. And I'll see you December 6th. Yes, sir, you will. Beautiful. Thank you. No problem.